This conference will now be recorded.
Okay, we are going to start in a uh, uh, couple of minutes. Uh, and unfortunately, there has been a change of program uh, because we were supposed to have uh, Professor Koronen joining us uh, today. But there were some uh, <coughs> technical uh, difficulties. Uh, um, uh, essentially, he didn't know how to operate the uh, uh, conferencing platform. So what we have decided has been to postpone the event with Professor Coronan to next week. And uh, mm, it will happen according to a slightly different format. Uh, it will be a Q&A session. We will email you soon about this. Uh, so we uh, still uh, decided to uh, uh, wait to essentially, you know, keep you busy on uh, uh, Friday afternoon uh, and uh, arrange the a seminar with uh, a member of uh, uh, our network who will discuss uh, a very recent paper of yours of, of his published in. Uh, top uh, journal. And I think Akis will introduce uh, uh, today's uh, speaker. Akis, are you with us? Akis? Hi. Hi, Andrea. Sorry, I had some uh, technical uh, problems here. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, shall we start or shall we wait a bit? No, I, I think we can make a start also because Mario has got uh, quite a tight uh, schedule, so it's better we start in time. Uh, of course, okay. we are recording this, so it will be made available to everybody. Okay, we have the uh, honor today to have with us uh, Dr. Mario Pancera, who is, who is one of the most uh, leading expert uh, on uh, responsible innovation and uh, a recent uh, 2020 <clears throat> recipient of uh, the prestigious uh, ERC grant uh, for a project on uh, the growth uh, called uh, Prospera. And today he is going to um, analyze us uh, the potential of, uh, let's say, uh, going beyond this uh, notion of uh, economic growth and uh, whether uh, there is a potential to have uh, innovation and uh, the possibility of actually changing uh, our society to a much better ex extent. Um, Mario, please, if you want uh, to start. Uh, thank you very much. F. Karisto, Akis. I don't know how to uh, share my screen. This is the first mm -hmm. time I, I give presentation in GoToMeeting. Next so I to the microphone and camera icons, there is a third one called the screen. You just uh, click that button and uh, uh, you will present. OK. Uh, OK. I need to give permission because my Mac is uh, obsessed with security and privacy. Um, I think now I will be able to do this. Okay, they say that I need to restart, go, go to meeting. Okay, just give me one second. Okay. Yeah, so apparently technical difficulties uh, are uh, a constant uh, for the uh, speakers uh, we wanted to have uh, uh, today. Uh, so let's see, Mario, can you present now? The microphone. Yeah, we, we can't see you and uh, we can't hear you now. Andrea, probably he cannot hear you. Sorry? 
Uh, yeah. Okay, we can see that, but uh, we cannot hear you uh, and we can't see you. We can just see the screen. So well, I think that we are ready now. Okay, we are ready. So let's let's make a start. Okay, so thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you very much, Akis. I must say that this was a quite rush presentation. Um, but anyway, I I will try to make my best to uh, to show what uh, we are trying to do in the field of uh, uh, creating a different alternative view of innovation and technology. So as Aki said, uh, the purpose of this seminar <clears throat> is to introduce you to my last pa paper published this week, two days ago actually, uh, in uh, in the journal uh, organization, which is uh, one of the journals of the critical management community. The title of the paper is Innovation Without Growth, Frameworks for Understanding Technological Change in a Post-Growth Era. Uh, however, I must say that uh, more than answering questions, this paper uh, is, was designed to make uh, provocative questions. Huh? So, and these questions are not totally addressed uh, by this preliminary work. Um, that that is why I would also take the chance to introduce my my new grants uh, as uh, I guess uh, introduce it is uh, the title is Prospera that in in in, in Italian means thrive um, so the idea is this how to frame innovation in a post growth uh, society or post growth economy. Uh, this is an ERC grant, uh, a grant uh, funded by the European Research Council. Uh, it's about 1.5 million euros and will run for the next five years. So the paper is to say is um, the paper is um, is somehow uh, represent the theoretical background of the project. Okay, I start with this paper uh, that was submitted more than two years ago just to give you an, an, an idea of the times that you need to publish in a, in a good journal in social science. Um, and and, and the, pap the, 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 the paper contains the, the theoretical background of, of what is going to be the, um, the project. So I, more than the paper, uh, what I want to do today is to uh, present some guiding ideas that underpin the projects and the main research question that also will be at the center of the projects. However, I think this, this, this speech will be, will be quite short because I don't want to again get into the details. If you have questions about the methodological details uh, about the paper and the kind of uh, idea uh, from a met methodological perspective that I will, uh, we will, imply, we will uh, use in the, during the, the projects, we can have a, a discussion after, after my, my presentation. What I want to do is to make some provocative questions. And I hope that this provocative question can stimulate uh, the debate uh, in our community as a retrace and also a general debate about what is the, the meaning of innovation, what, or what is the meaning of technology, and, and what, is, what, what are the implications for circular economy? Because I assume that most of us, or most of us here are working in the field of circular economy. Okay, so if you have problem with my Spanish Italian accent, please stop me and I will try to repeat. I think that everybody has an accent here, no? Okay, so today I want to talk about uh, technology innovation, which is an issue that uh, I'm very passionate about. But I don't want to talk it in a, in a way, uh, <clears throat> in a classical way. So I don't want to talk about how innovation is, how good is innovation or how bad innovation can also be, right? Uh, what I want to do, what I want to do is, is to make these provocative, provocative questions, assuming that every, everyone has a more or less a clear idea of what innovation means. So my first question is, what is innovation for? Or rather, for whom is innovation for? Hmm? The gentleman in this picture, <clears throat> this is uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, an Austrian uh, American, uh, economist, he was uh, very sure about the meaning of innovation. For Schumpeter, innovation is the real engine of capitalism. Innovation is creation, creation that destroys and makes obs obsolete all the pre-existing artifact practices, even culture and, and way of doings and way of being. So uh, 
innovation generates mechanism of creative destruction, as you better used to say. No, it's a, it's a process of continuous destruction. Um, and this creative destruction is an, the essential fact of capitalism. It's not, it's, it, it, we are not talking about the byproduct of, of capitalism. We are talking about something that's without its ca capitalism as market economy as we know it, it wouldn't be possible at all. So uh, capitalism can't exist without creating new things. No, this is the basic idea of uh, the creative destruction of Schumpeter. So it needs to expand and grow. At the same time, capitalism cannot exist without destroying the old. No, so this is the idea of, of the innovation that Schumpeter had in mind. And of course, one can argue about what capitalism is or what it means. You know, there are many different uh, uh, formalization or conceptualization of capitalism. Uh, but it's clear that uh, for Schumpeter, uh, cap capitalism refers to a uh, production of goods and services in, at an industrial scale in the market economy. And this was at least clear for Schumpeter. That is more or less uh, the kind of economy in which we all uh, live, or, or I would say that the vast majority of humanity uh, live in. So basically what Schumpeter said, I think, uh, is, is very is, is evident today, no? it's, uh, it's clear. Our economic system advances and survives through the creation of new products and services. However, the most interesting thing about this phenomenon is that <clears throat> along this, with this process of creative destruction, the system also comes with an ideology that is connected to this mechanism, you know, continuously creating new things and destroying new things. Or, and many will say, uh, a religion, a religion of growth, a faith. Innovation increases productivity, thus increasing the speed at which we exploit natural resources and the process of capitalism accumulation accelerates, right? So innovation as a consequence is fundamental to generate economic growth, right? So without this engine, without this mechanism of, of creative uh, destruction, we cannot have economic growth. So innovation equals economic growth. I call it a religion <clears throat> because basically as any religion is based on dogmas uh, that are usually immune to criticism and to empirical evidence that can potentially dismiss them. No, uh, The dogma in this case is that we must grow. The last two decades uh, were characterized in industrial countries by very low uh, growth rates. So a as a reaction, in this connection between innovation and growth, so that innovation equals growth, has become a kind of mantra. No, we have to grow, then we have to innovate. What do we? Why do we have to innovate? Because we have to grow, and so in a loop, in a vicious circle. And now it's pretty much evident that there are some limits, like some material limits to growth, and also in very competitive economies like our economies. We are not growing. Actually, in some cases, especially after the 2008 or now with the with the COVID crisis, we are actually degrowing. So that the, the GDP, that this is the way we we measure economic growth, is is decreasing. Huh? But despite this idea, though, this irrational uh, rush to economic growth, uh, this idea this idea that we must grow is so ingrained in Western world. Uh, that we no longer wonder, show me, tell me, why do we need to grow at all, right? This is uh, something that is, is going unquestioned. We never question why we need to grow. Of course, if you ask economists uh, or, or even uh, politicians, they have their, their answer. No, they would un answer uh, that, uh, uh, that we that we need growth because we need uh, to create jobs, that we need to repay debts, that we need to enlarge the kick of the economies because this is this is the only way we can distribute the the the, the, the fruits of growth, right? But uh, I think that this uh, this answer are not very convincing, at least from my perspective. My answer is that we don't we don't have to grow, we don't have to grow. At least it doesn't make any sense to grow indefinitely. 
in nature, no one's growth indefinitely, not even bacteria or viruses. Hmm? A child grows, but uh, then it stops. No, I have my, I have two kids. They will, they are growing now very fastly. They, they are, they are eating a lot. But at at some point, hopefully, for my financial um, resource, because my financial resources are limited, I hope that one day they will stop. So they will become adult and stop growing, right? So there are many arguments. So I, and I don't want, I don't have here the intention to, you know, have, uh, give you a, an overall picture of, of what are the main criticism and critics uh, to this idea of uh, infinite growth. Um, there are many uh, arguments against growth, no? Uh, and, and it, it is impossible to discuss it now. What is becoming quite clear from an increasing uh, scientific literature on the topic is that there are very good reasons to think that there are at least two kind of limits. Physical limits that are treated by, that are discussed and debated in the fields of ecological economics uh, or in the, in the, in the fields of uh, even physics, uh, like the, 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 the seminal work of Georgescu Rogan about the entropy of economic system, the fact that economy is a dissipative system uh, that consume energy and material. Uh, but there are also like uh, social limits. I'm talking about the fields of political ecology or, or, or the famous very nice book uh, by Fred Hirsch about the social limits to growth. No? The essential fact about this work is that the growth of indicators like the GDP does not guarantee us a qualitative improvement or more recently, not even in quantitative improvements of our lives. No? Look at the fact that my generation is, is earning less than our parents in relative terms. Our, our life is more precarious and unstable, no? despite having, um, despite the, the continuous growth of the last 30 years. So what uh, does that have to do with innovation? Well, we have, say, we have said, uh, I said before that innovation is an essential fact of capitalism. And another essential fact of capitali capitalism is the fact that capitalism needs expansion. Mm -hmm. So without innovation, there is no growth in this, in this, in this framing, in this way of thinking, no? Uh, so, that, uh, so my question is, without growth, there is no innovation. So at if, if we accept the fact that at, this, at a certain point in the near future, we will stop uh, growing, or actually we, had, we already stopped in the northern in, in the Western country to grow, if you look at the microeconomic indicators, that means that we have to abandon the idea of, uh, of innovation. We have to abandon the idea of uh, technological progress. We have to abandon this idea of creativity. I don't think so. But to explain this, we need to quickly see what kind of innovation we are talking about. We have to uh, get a little bit deeper into this idea of innovation as a creative destruction uh, that uh, Schumpeter was referring to in the, in the 30s and the 40s of the last century. So in my opinion, this conventional idea of innovation is based on two basic assumptions. The first one is that technological progress is irreversible. And that's normally called in literature technological determinism. The second assumption is that this irreversible progress is always good and positive. And this can be called productivism. I think that these two assumptions are false. Let's, 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 say, let's see why I think this is, this is true. Technological determinism is a myth, in my opinion, for many reasons. Today, we know that technology evolves, and this evolution depends on the social political condition. No? In the first uh, summer school in Sheffield, I gave a lecture to the Retrace uh, uh, group about the responsible innovation in which we discussed the fact that technological development is a social constructed phenomenon. It means that the, the idea of the people and the ideology of the people who design technology are directly reflected in, into the implementation of this technology, of the technology that, that these people are, are, are producing. Uh, so any kind of technology evolves in a social 
political and cultural environment. It's subjected to a historical contingency and, of course, cultural environments. The design of a technological artifact, for example, we know that it depends on the vision, worldviews, ideology of its creators. The field of science and technology studies has shown this very well. No? In addition, we have documented the rapid development processes and time of stagnation. So there is no like a uniform, uni universal technological change. Mm -hmm. So the process of technological change is not deterministic, we can say. Moreover, we know that there is uh, never one possible path of development, but always multiple paths with many alternatives. In other words, technology development is also and above all a matter of political choices. Mm -hmm. The anthropologist David Greber wondered why we don't travel around uh, in flying in flying cars. In the 1960s, everyone thought that in the 20th century, 21st century, we would have arrived on Mars and the head bases on the moon. What's happened? Well, it's happened that investment in space exploration was abandoned because it was no longer political necessary. The Soviet Union collapsed and the money was, the money was directed elsewhere. So it was not, no longer necessary. So productivism, and then we have productivism. That is another myth. Today we know very well that is uh, that not everything used is, is an improvement, and that not not all technology are good. We could be talking for hours about it. Uh, all the controversies about nuclear power, uh, genetic modified uh, organisms, the problem of fracking, uh, the impact of social media uh, in, in, in on teenager and on, 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 on the election, the national ele election. So we know that technology can be good and technology can be bad as well, also dramatically bad. So for example, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that uh, GO, GMO or fracking are, or the case of Bhopal, the disaster of Bhopal in India are improvements. And, and, and then above all, for whom this technology represents an improvement. In addition, there is a very important issue uh, if it is true that innovation is designed to solve problems, its implementation also causes other and new unexpected problems. The productivist paradigm has no mechanism to reflect on problems generated when solving other problems. In other words, the way that new technology is introduced within the growth-driven or growth-addicted addicted capitalism system doesn't take into account its potential negative consequences. Responsible innovation, the framework of responsible innovation partially address, addresses this problem. It's an attempt to solve the problem from, from within the system. So then my next provocative question is the following. If there is no growth without innovation and there is no innovation without growth, and if growth is some, somehow bad, or at least something that is not sustainable for the future, are we doomed to live in a world without innovation, without change, without technological progress, without no creativity at all? I don't think so. And I think that I believe that technological determinism and productivism actually carve creativity. To think that, I think uh, all all we can to, to, to think this uh, to have this idea that all we can do is to create new products and services to sell in a competitive mar market. I think it's a very limiting idea, and actually I would say that it's a quite miserable idea, no? very narrow kind of idea. We can think of new idea of a new idea of innovation that is not based on. Uh, on, on this idea of creative destruct, destruction, but on, on, on an idea based on, on idea based on ethics and practice of care, a creativity based on the potential to take care of things, uh, to, um, to take care of the environment, to take care of people rather than destroy old stuff and create new stuff. And this is more or less what uh, people like Ivan Illich and Andre Gors uh, called called uh, in convivial technologies. And technolo technology whose uh, purposes are not uh, the market or are not only the markets or the maximization of the indicators like a GDP, 
but uh, a purpose based on the ability of people to do things together in a convivial way. Uh, Ivan Illich convivial technology has several dimensions. Uh, I can mention some here, like accessibility, the capacity to, to have uh, the possibility to access, modify, or take part in the process of design of any technology. Um, the ability to, uh, to create a technology that can provide, that can solve social needs, not only to provide uh, benefits and on profits or increase profits. Here, I don't want to get into the details, so because I want to invite you, everybody, to read these three wonderful book. One is Tool for Conviviality, and the second one is Ecology as Politics. So I would like everyone in this room to read to read this book. Uh, what I want to do is to just to get a little bit some uh, to introduce you some of the details of the paper. The paper gives uh, this theoretical in, in introduction and then make another provocative question is, we know that economic growth is not a very good idea. We know that probably it doesn't solve social problems. We know that probably it creates more social problems and environmental problems. And we know that the idea of innovation and technological progress that we have now is very limited. How an innovation process and how organizations that are creating innovation would look like in a society that is, is, that is not obsessed with economic growth. This was this, the, the, the guiding uh, uh, research question of this paper. And in order to answer that, we uh, based, uh, we, we, did, we ran a preliminary analysis of, uh, of what we think are those organizations that already are, are already decoupling innovation and creativity from economic growth. So here in this slide, there is uh, a picture that is linked to one of uh, uh, each, each one of the cases that we present in the paper. The first one is the movement of Aprobec technology uh, started by uh, Fritz Schumacher. Uh, the second one is the, is the network that um, was created in, the, in 2004 in Brazil to address uh, through technology, through very simple and affordable technology, problems in rural area in Brazil. Uh, a third case study is the grassroots, uh, grassroots innovation movements, that is a, a sort of evolution of appropriate movements, uh, appropriate technology movements uh, of, the C, of the 70s. The fourth case is, uh, is the case of the social, um, social cops movements in Italy that's been very influential, especially in the center and the north of Italy uh, from, the, from the 70s. And the last case is the case of peer production, uh, the idea of pop labs, makers, uh, community, uh, open source community like La Linux or uh, open hardware community. So I invite everybody to read the paper. Uh, so instead of entering into methodological details of the paper, I would like to just to introduce some of the of the results of the paper that are summarized in this uh, in this table. So essentially, what we have to, uh, what we have done is to uh, create a first line to distinguish between what we have called growth-oriented organization and post-growth-oriented organization. And we analyzed uh, the differences between these two kind of uh, uh, ideal kind of uh, classification or, or typology. Of, of, of organization using nine dimensions. So for example, the first dimension is the underpinning values that are guiding the, the, uh, the two, two different kinds of organization, the pro-growth uh, organization and the post-growth organization. And what we found is that normally people working in the post-growth organization are more likely to be guided and driven by concepts like social justice, equality. So they, are, they feel that their work is all, as also a political component. Then there is uh, also like other dimensions that are more related to the kind of production and the, and, uh, the kind of uh, goods that are uh, produced by, by such organization. For example, underpinning resourcing in uh, conventional organization are characterized by approbation approbation of common resources like you know water land natural resources uh, even public go goods and labor why many of the cases that we analyzed have uh, a different way of sharing 
a different way of using resources. So they are work. Uh, they are mo most of most most of time they are working on the, on this notion of uh, public commons. Um, uh, they valorize or reinforce community democratic control over technology as a completely different way of uh, framing the kind of resources that organization needs. And then there are differences in the terms of ownership uh, versus uh, and governance. Uh, so, for example, we say there is a clear, this clear tendency in post-growth or, uh, oriented organization towards a more democratic uh, organization within factories, for example, if you, if you consider uh, um, phenomenon like, like open source, there is no organization at all that is completely distributed. There is difference in production and consumption part partners, for example, post-growth organization tends to be more local to use shorter value chain and most importantly to have uh, to involve consumer in the decision making about what to produce and how to produce so i have an example 90 percent of my food uh, here in my village is produced by a couple of people that i know so i can go there and see what they what they are doing and i can also you know i can also make a suggestion to do the way they are producing my food, the food that I'm consuming. Uh, there are other characteristics, like for, for example, the way surplus is produced and used is very different in the two cases. Uh, pro uh, post growth or oriented organization tends to reinvest uh, the surplus. And <clears throat> the problem is that most of these organizations don't have a lot of surplus, but when they generate surplus, normally they I have mechanism to decide uh, democratically how to use and how to invest the surplus. There is enormous difference in the way intellectual property is framed and conceptualized. Uh, most of post-growth oriented organizations are against uh, patenting, for example. So, of course, there are uh, um, alternative form of protecting uh, intellectual property like open source, free license, uh, distribute form of knowledge production, etc. And then there are also important differences in the in the way technology is designed. You know? uh, growth oriented organization tends to be huge with uh, uh, with, with big R and D departments. Uh, they tends to rely a lot on expert knowledge, expert design, highly reliant on science output, uh, and of course there is also a, this phenomenon of plan obsolescence. Why? Because they are designed to create, not to care about things. They are designed to uh, create products that goes to the market and as quick as, quick as possible end up in a landfill, right? On the other side, we have uh, models that together with technology and science and expert knowledge, combine this knowledge with other form of knowledge like some of the cases in brazil for example combine expert knowledge with indigenous knowledge no? they tend to produce convivial form of technology by using other form of knowledge more empirical form of knowledge knowledge that are produced within the community not only in the lab is it is important to say that post growth oriented organization at least the kind of organization and cases that i analyzed they are not anti-science, they are not anti-technology, they don't reject technology, they just uh, attempt to in include other sources of knowledge, other sources of uh, production of knowledge. Finally, we can talk about different uh, forms of power relationship. Organization like more conventional organization think, for example, of big, big multinational corporation are usually <clears throat> embedded in socioeconomic clusters that tend to escape democratic control. Uh, for example, think about all the uh, international treaty about free trade. They are, uh, none of them is transparent. No, nobody has access to the, uh, to the negotiation phase of this, uh, of this treaty. Uh, so it's very difficult to understand how the decision making is uh, is uh, how decisions are, are taken within this uh, uh, negotiation. They enjoy the support of political elites and scientific institutions. On the other side, on the other side, we have uh, we have found organizations that uh, usually rely on social uh, on, on local social network, like the, the case of social cops 
in Italy, no? Their life is based on the legitimacy, the legitimacy they have in the community. Some, some of these organizations explicitly challenge the dominant power structure in the search of social emancipation and autonomy, no? We have formal organization that overly challenge the power structure that in some cases create like uh, discrimination and social exclusion. So what, what is clear, what is, uh, what is uh, crystal clear in the cases of post growth oriented organization is that those organizations see themselves as a political instrument of social transformation. I think this is probably one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, results of the study. And finally, the scale, and this is not surprising. The uh, uh, usual conventional business as usual in conventional organizations tends to, to have a very different scale, uh, but have a tendency to huge uh, aggregation oligopolies. In some of the cases that we have analyzed, uh, we are talking about reduced scale or at least distribute scale, like in the case of open source community. No, we don't, you don't have. You cannot identify a specific organization, so you cannot talk about scale in the conventional way. And then they have an important characteristic that instead of scaling up in terms of size, they tend to reproduce the model instead of scaling up. So, for example, many of the social cooperative that uh, the people that I interviewed in social cooperative uh, movements, they say we don't have, we don't want to become bigger, because if we become bigger, our internal democracy will collapse. So what we want to do is to replicate. We want to come to be contagious. We want other people, other organizations to replicate our, our structure. We don't want to, to grow. Huh? So this is this is this is very important to me. I think mean, this is a very relevant kind of difference. So and finally, to conclude, I want to introduce a little bit the structure of uh, of the of my new uh, research grant because why because this paper is just an introduction as I see at the beginning of the speech uh, this paper um, creates more question than the question that um, uh, aspires to uh, to address uh, so I think there are a lot of uh, open question and that are very exciting question so I invite uh, I invite you to read the paper and to, uh, to, to get inspiration from the paper and to create your own research question based on the paper. So the structure of the, of the, of the project. This is going to be a, like a, a, a very, very long project, quite com complicated project. And uh, this will be based on, on four main uh, research work packages. So the idea is to answer this basic Four research questions that are, are also mentioned at the end of the paper. The first one is to try to combine all the academic traditions and scholarship and disciplines that have theorized the possibility and necessity to formulate alternative uh, view on science, technology, and innovation. Why? Because we have a lot of community uh, that, uh, that feel, that perceive each other as uh, as competitors, while actually having them as complementary community. For example, you have uh, a critical theorist. You have now a very, very increasingly influential community like the degrowth community. You have uh, ecological economics. You have uh, people talking about steady state economics. Uh, you have a lot of people talking about uh, social innovation. So you have a lot of people that are talking essentially about the different, uh, exactly the same things, uh, but coming from different backgrounds. So I think it's important to articulate uh, articulate this idea of post-growth innovation in a coherent manner that is able to uh, <clears throat> to create links between these uh, this, uh, this, uh, this communities. Second, uh, it's important to, uh, to focus on the organization as a, as, a, as a nucleus, as a core in which uh, change technology, technological change occur, and to understand what are the antecedent enabler and values that, that drive the emergence, the emergence of non-growth oriented organization. And I will, I will try, we will try to do it in 10 uh, cross-national case studies. So the idea is to uh, is to understand how this this uh, this this organization that already experimenting with this post growth idea of uh, of innovation, 
are organizing themselves, are surviving, are struggling, uh, or how they are thriving. Third research question, what are the conditions and mechanisms that may allow non-growth organization to form networks? Because what we observe is that many times you have a, 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 an occupied factory, for example, that is struggling with uh, against the surrounding environment. Because when you are creating something alternative to the system, you have uh, you you find yourself surrounded by a hostile environment. So your provider, your supplier are not selling are no longer selling you products, for example, not because it's not no longer convenient, but because if they do that and and you and you as an alternative organization, you prove that your model is successful, and this is a symbol. Huh? So they the, the surrounding environment will do anything to to crush to crush you. So it's important to see how. Uh, alternative organization can organize in networks. Finally, and I think this is probably the most exciting uh, research question in terms of uh, political action, I think it's important to understand what are the social actors and their allies who can inspire uh, or who can trigger this transition toward the post-growth uh, science and technology and innovation system. Why? Because without, in my opinion, without political action, uh, change, is not, change is not possible. So we can have a very nice uh, theoretical model about how post-growth organization uh, should work, but without, um, without an alliances of social actors that are willing to implement these uh, this, this alternative models, we, we basically we won't go anywhere. So I, I finished my speech and uh, I hope that uh, uh, this, my short presentation uh, really stimulates uh, the debate. Uh, even though you, are, you disagree with me, with me with, on, on certain aspects, I, I really hope the, the idea was not to agree on something. The idea was, the idea was to stimulate the debate and also make uh, also like uh, by making provocative questions that in some, in some cases can be quite disturbing. Hmm? Okay, I finished. Thank you, uh, Mario. And uh, is there any questions? Somebody would like uh, to ask questions. I have. Uh, couple of questions, uh, but let's give precedence to somebody else. So uh, yeah. there is Amos uh, in, the, in the, Mariana, go, go ahead, yeah. Yes, hi everybody. Um, yeah, a lot of things. Uh, I, I agree with the debate, but actually I agree with you. And so thank you for your presentation, Mario. But my question is really simple. Why you call it post-growth and not the growth. Is there any marketing there or any specific reason? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the, the reason is very simple because the, this paper is within a special issue uh, that uh, uh, is about post-growth economies. Uh, so this, the, basically, the, the title is uh, was adjusted to um, to the special issue title. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very sympathetic, as mo some of you will, would know about the notion of degrowth. Uh, we can argue if degrowth is a happy word in the sense that it's a positive that they call it a positive idea or uh, or or a negative uh, or an attracting. Uh, idea of you know re reduction is something ne negative right uh, i can say that i, I like this the the, the 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 slogan the growth as a, as a slogan as a as a, a political provocation and this was the idea the, the initial idea of the growth was not to create like um uh, like a, a theory or or like a precise uh, uh label to, to be attached to to be attached to a specific academic discipline the, the origin of, of, of the of the degrowth uh, uh, it was just a provocation uh, but if we want to want if you want to talk about the marketing of uh, of this idea I, I think that we need to work on different fronts I think that there are people that will be persuaded like me by the terms degrowth and so that's okay 
there are a lot of people that would be much uh, more easily per, uh, persuaded by uh, something like post growth or steady state economy. Hmm? I'm talking about most of the economy, econo economies that I know, for example. So I don't reject the growth, but I say I say I, I think that we we need we need to use different fronts. And we need to use different way of uh, of talking about basically the same essential arguments. That is how we need how we reframe our economy that in a way that is compatible with uh, with with life, social life and environmental life. That's all. Okay, thank you. I'm also you. Interested. Um, is there is there any harmony between ethics and profits? Uh, Yes, I think it's, it depends on how you how you how you frame and how you define what is the legitimate uh, level of profits. I mean, this is a very easy uh, and basic uh, uh, topic. The problem is that we in our society we haven't deci decided what is the legitimate uh, level of profits that an individual individual can achieve. If we can decide it. We can say, for example, in the last book on the on the growth by the, 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 the growth community in Barcelona, they propose some, some caps, and these caps are very high. Now we are talking about like millions of euros. So I mean, it's a post-growth society can be perfectly compatible with, uh, with the cap on income that can be 1 million, 2 millions, 3 million euros. Also depends on the cultural settings, no? The 1 million, for example, in, in Zimbabwe uh, can be a lot. So I mean, if we, we don't have, even have this debate about caps, putting a caps of income. We don't have it. I don't, so I don't know if I answer your question, Amos, but I think this is a problem of, uh, or is a problem of deciding well, what, what are the limits of, uh, of individual profits. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mario. Uh, I have a question, and uh, it's something you have touched upon. Uh, in your presentation. I think, you know, the other typology of uh, organizations is quite interesting. Yeah. But I think, you know, the reality is that these days uh, we don't have any more vertically integrated uh, firms. Uh, we have firms which produce something, some components, and they sell it to somebody else, will assemble it, and then uh, these uh, semi-finished goods will be assembled into a more complex products and so on. Uh, even if you apply these you know, to uh, cooperatives in the agricultural setting, uh, well, I'm doing a secondment, uh, as you know, at the moment as part of the proceeds project in an agricultural cooperative. So technically what we could classify as a sort of post-growth organization because they, embrace this view we don't want to become massive uh, we want to stay the size uh, we are uh, we distribute the surplus to our uh, uh, our members but then in the end uh, they sell the things they produce the lemons they produce uh, to uh, you know to have a safe income and to have safe revenues, they sell it to big supermarkets. So the question I'm asking to you is how realistic is in a world where we have global value chains, where we have uh, interconnected supply chains, uh, how realistic is to, to embrace this model in a world where uh, it's very difficult to have an organization which takes care uh, of all the uh, aspects of production of goods uh, and services. Hmm. Well, um, it's, it's, I think it's very positive uh, your, your your question because this was the the idea is to provo provoke such a question uh, that I don't have the answer of this question. I what I can say is that what we present in the, in the paper is. Uh, is an initial mod model, and uh, the, the goal of the model is just to create a, a space to debate that uh, the importance of creating a different frameworks uh, in which we can discuss about the possibility of creating organizations that are not driven by by growth. 
so as a, as a result, the classification is a very ideal, it's a, and a very ideal classification. And of course, it cannot apply as it is in the real world, because the real world is much more complex. And as we, we show in, in one of the case of the social cops, for example, the social cops make a lot of compromises for, uh, for survival, basically. What you say, it seems to be more a mix of uh, what I say at the end of political action. No, uh, The fact that there are people willing to experiment alternative forms of organization, the fact that there are people that are willing to uh, to buy the things that they need to 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 for for their survival for for their livelihood to this kind of organization is not enough. Now you need a political uh, engagement. You need like a, also political movements that will create law, for example, that favor uh, this this form of organization and create incentive to create this, uh, this organization. But even though you will never be sure that this, uh, these new forms will not be co-opted, like, like the case of the classical cooperatives uh, in Italy, you know, that are totally now under the, the capitalist mode of production. Uh, so I don't have a clear answer to this. this no, I, but you know, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, what I would suggest, and this is something that maybe we can look at together, is uh, that probably what we need to look at is not uh, post-growth organizations, but probably post-growth supply chains, value chains, uh, supply networks. So how to have a network of uh, organizations which cooperate to create value sharing these underlying assumptions uh, no, no, definitely, but this is this is what this is what the the yeah. the third question yeah. is and to create to, to create networks probably i wouldn't okay. i was not so precise I, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this uh this no, idea that's, of that's right. thank you there is Akis who would like to ask a question okay Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mario. Uh, going to work package one and uh, talking about critical thinking. Um, I think that one of the most critical schools of thought uh, was the Frankfurt, was Frankfurt. And uh, in fact, there was the debate between Adorno and Benjamin, whether the entry of technology then could lead uh, to the politicis politicization of uh, of, cons of consumer society. So Benjamin, let's say, was uh, quite optimistic. Uh, Adorno was not so much. And uh, as we see, I mean, today, the consumer society has become the, the leader of this growth paradigm. So making the connection also with uh, what Andrea asked and you discussed after it. Uh, do, you, do you think that in order to actually achieve a transition towards a post-growth society that it would be necessary to go beyond the contemporary urbanized uh, system that we are all living in and speaking about supply chains i think that the post-growth paradigm existed and existed for many years and we can see it if we compare the north and south europe in North Europe, there is nothing like local production, nothing like personal relationships between a butcher or a, or a shop. Everything is online, everything is mass. We are talking about massive orders always. So don't you think that a transition, that in order to achieve a transition that we should overcome the classic urbanized society that we are all living in? Thank you. Okay, I mean, I think that you make many questions in one question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, if the if the if the main question I think is that you, is is this idea of a post growth uh, organization compatible with the the present social order? Uh, we say clearly at the end of the paper. I don't think we it is. So a post-growth uh, society or post-growth organization that is, is, is creative, 
but in the way that take care that takes care about people and things and the environment. For, for us in the paper, it is very clear as written at the end of the paper, is not compatible with the present social order. But this is our ideological position. And then if the other question is about uh, urban, and this is a much more complex one, I don't know. I personally speaking, I'm not a big fan of coming back to land. I, I don't think that the life in the in the rural area 50 years ago were a paradise. Yeah? It was full of, uh, of oppression uh, and unequal social relationship. Uh, so I don't think that this, that the, the key is to come back uh, to the land. What is true and what is evident, and this is one of the main results of the ecological economics uh, field, is that if you analyze the social metabolism of cities in the way they are now, so the big city, they are not compatible with the sustainable use of resources. I mean, this is evident. This is uh, something that uh, is clear. So we need to find a different balance between the urban life and, and rural life, I think. And, and, and the second point that I, would, I want to be very clear because many times people say, oh, you want to come back to the cave. Uh, post growth organizations are not organizations that are low tech. Convivial technology are not necessarily low tech technology. We are talking about a different way of deciding, uh, of making decisions about um, technology, not a different level of uh, uh, sophistication. What is true is that many, in many cases, sophistication is, is usually atta attached to the interest of the creative destruction. Eh? Eh, so eh, so the, re the result of this is that the capitalist system is producing highly sophisticated technology. But there is no, uh, nothing that, 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 that makes me think that in a post society, uh, in a post growth society, we will be living in, 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 in a world that uh, I cannot buy at the computer that I'm, I'm using now. It is a Mac. Hmm? So I want to be very clear about that. Degrowth or post growth is not coming back to land or in this ideal world in which we all live in the, in the field and we are all happy or in the cave or come back to a hunter-gatherer community. Uh, Thank you, just to clarify, I didn't mean... And, uh, sorry, uh, I guess, I mean, we okay. have uh, other questions okay. for you. Mario needs to go soon. Uh, I think this is time for last question. Uh, Renato, would you like to go on? Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Mario, for your very interesting and challenging uh, 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 presentation. So I have a couple of questions. The first one is a consideration about what you say about the fair to scale up of small uh, uh, cooperatives or uh, companies. Um, this fair, according to this fair to scale up, does represent a limit in terms of uh, economic advantages for, uh, uh, for people, for producers, but also for consumers. Um, and this brings some uh, other, a couple of other questions. Like uh, um, the first one is about the, uh, the democratic, the democracy in the governance of these companies. So the question is, uh, uh, if the democratic governance of small firms uh, or cooperatives as institutions uh, as a cost. Okay, and. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and this brings another question that, that is, uh, um, that is uh, it is very relevant to build up networks, communities, as you said, and, um, and how to build these communities. And this is a part of your research agenda, in particular is uh, your uh, research question three that also Andrea uh, mentioned. Um, if so, if this is correct, does this mean that uh, the air costs uh, are supported by consumers, uh, let's say markets in general? And the second question is a more is another question is more general. Uh, according to your, according to um, uh, your research path, 
Um, is it possible, according to you, uh, in your research part, uh, that the uh, it have alternatives that is uh, innovation with the growth can be reachable, can be considered, or is uh, completely uh, out of your uh, perspective? Thank you. Okay. I start with, by, with, uh, by answering the, the second question very quickly because I need to go in five minutes. Um, <clears throat> the second question, uh, I don't think it, do we have to question growth uh, in any cases. I think there are many sectors in which growth uh, uh, must be pursue, pursued, uh, pursued. So for example, in, in the so-called, I, I hate this expression, uh, developing uh, world, and I, I use the special global south, we need, there are sectors in which we need growth, quantitative growth. No? And even in our society, in terms of public educa education, and the problem is that we are framing in, 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 a, in a wrong way. We, we, we use the word growth. We can use like, we could have used different expression. So I'm not against growth per se. I'm against the obsession of growth. I'm, I'm against putting growth at the center of our goal as a society which is very different. No? I think that in many sectors in the North and in the Global South, we need to increase, for example, the material consumption of, 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 of many people in the Global South. And you can do this with redistribution of wealth, for example. So we can have innovation for growth in certain cases. The first question is about, uh, in this new world of a uh, very nice world populated by post-growth organization will be the consumer that will pay this extra cost of democracy i mean that democracy is a cost for for a company internal democracy is a company because they are competing with competing they are competing with non-democratic uh, conventional forms of organization and that's why we need a the law. That's why we need the state or we need the community to regulate because we have to create incentives that allow this uh, community of producers that have extra cost compared to, to this conventional to be competitive. Because if you <laughs> create a situation in which you have the two systems that are running in the same way, of course they will win the capitalist uh, conventional organization because the system is designed for them. And then we can discuss if democracy is a cost or not, because your question is very much the kind of question that an economist would, would, would make. Uh, so talking about a productive unit that is designed to deliver economic uh, benefit. For, for us, economic, economic production unit is not uh, only designed to produce economic benefit, but the main goal is to produce social benefits. So this is the first goal. The second goal is to be, of course, uh, efficient in some way, because of course you cannot produce something spending more than what you get as a benefit. Of course, but this is the second aspect. This is not the most important aspect. Okay. So I in this sense, no, mm -hmm. just me reply about the first question. So you you uh, you should use the word development instead than growth i think it's much more correct many, to many people say the quality no, of the growth development right. yeah, this is something that every every time is is emerging it's from another story. but the problem is that the world development is so has been so attached to the word growth that basically people are meaning the same the meaning is the same People are using growth and development in the same way. We, we had, we had an, uh, this discussion in, 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 in another uh, presentation a few weeks ago, and they say, okay, but we are talking about development. We don't need to, we don't need to grow, we need development. Yeah, but every time you, you, you look at the developments in any report, in any political discourses, development and growth are basically the same things. And, and also, I question also the idea of development because the idea of development also has this idea of continuous development and infinite development. These are all concepts that are somehow related to growth and development. Maybe we can talk about quali qualitative development, but we, we must be very clear about what we mean for development. Because most of the time, economy, economists uh, answer to my 
my argument say, okay, but we are talking about development. This is something that we already solved in our discipline. No, because you just change the world, but this, the essence is always the same. You use, uh, instead of saying growth, you say development, but basically you say the same. Also the human development index of the UN. Of course, there's, there are some social indicators or environmental indicators, but at the end of the day, it's an indicator that is supposed to grow. And they call it development indicator. At the end of the day, it's always the same soup. <laughs> Yes, the same okay. soup, but this means that we have to indicate, to investigate about this, uh, the meaning of the words, since uh, one is uh, an aspect of a qualitative and uh, more large perspective, and uh, the other one is more strictly to do to economic and the quantitative uh, growth. Gilbert Rist, so. who is a, a philosopher, a French philosopher and economist, wrote a book a few years ago called History of Development. And, and basically, if you look at the history of development, it's, it's a history of, uh, of growth. Uh, we can do like in circular economy, we can appropriate the notion of development and, 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 and try to change it. Historically, it's been quite difficult to do such an operation. But uh, I agree with you. We can, we can, you, you can take development I... and, and do it in a different way. We can do it. But what I, what I see, from the practice is that economies and people use development and growth in in the same way. So there is this risk. Okay, thank you, Mario. Uh, thank I you, Mario. know that uh, you need to go uh, because it's uh, 35 past. Uh, I think we should uh, have uh, an extra discussion in another situation. Probably the winter school would be. Uh, yeah, let's try to put some time aside at the winter school. I'm afraid, you know, the the schedule is quite busy. There are a lot of sessions, but yeah, let's try to uh, keep some time uh, to continue this uh, very stimulating uh, discussion. So once again, thank you very much, Mario. Congratulations for your uh, paper, uh, your grant, and uh, thank you to everybody for a very enjoyable discussion. Uh, we'll uh, send out soon the arrangements for next week for the Q&A session with uh, uh, Professor Coronen. Thank you very much and have a good weekend. Bye.